NOS locking. Over the past few years, NOS locking Pokemon games have become increasingly popular. Just look at YouTube. Around a month ago, I also decided to indulge in this popular form of Pokemon challenge. And this took me back to the Sinnoh region, a place I had not visited since childhood. What? To you. He's so dead. Don't crit. Don't crit. crit. Fuck, dude. Now, before I started, I thought that my knowledge from childhood was so good that not sucking the game would be so easy. Let me repeat. I thought. To make a long story short, I was very challenged. After five attempts not sucking this game, I knew I had to go about this in a smarter way. That led me to create this document. Pilgorn's Ultimate Guide to Platinum Nuzlocking. It's this document I'm going to talk about today. I personally made this document to help myself breeze through the center region, and sharing it was more of an afterthought. But hey, I already put in the effort, so why not pass it on to you? All it is, is essentially a guide to everything in Sinnoh. But in addition to that, it also improves your Nuzlocke experience tremendously. Take it from my friend here. You know, my favorite thing about this document is that I can see all the good items without having to interrupt my gameplay. Uh, that's great, but um, let's make sure we know the rules about the Nuzlocke first. Most people know this, but in case you don't, the traditional vanilla Nuzlocke rules goes as followed. The first Pokemon you encounter on a new route is the only Pokemon you're allowed to catch on said route. You must name all Pokemon you catch. If a Pokemon fates, it is considered dead and cannot be used. These are the most basic rules you have to follow in order to consider run a Nuzlocke. But even with these rules, the game is still pretty easy. In my eyes, still kid friendly. At least that's until you enter the big boy league, making your Nuzlocke into a hardcore Nuzlocke. When doing a hardcore Nuzlocke, these extra rules are added. Level caps prevent you from using any Pokemon above a certain level, almost almost determined by the highest level Pokemon of the next gym leader or Elite 4. This basically makes the fights more even. Battle mode setting must be on set. I didn't know this was a thing before I started, but you know that very nice feature you have when you defeat a trainer's Pokemon? And it not only tells you what Pokemon the trainer is going to bring out, but also asks you if you want to switch Pokemon. Yeah, this setting removes that. That means that you cannot easily counter everything that you meet. Well, if you want to do that, you need to switch in now. And if your Pokemon is very weak to anything that the opponent has, it has to take a hit from it, making it very dangerous. And that's gonna one shot it. Fuck, dude. This rule alone makes the game so much harder, but there's more. No item use in battle. This, in combination with playing on set, is what puts hard in hardcore Nuzlocke. Also, if all party Pokemon are defeated in the same battle, you white out and must start over. With these rules all together, any Pokemon game becomes hard. I don't care who you are, the game will be hard, okay? But that's not enough for me. Let me introduce you to Pilgorn's rules. No duplicate Pokemon, meaning you're only allowed to catch the same Pokemon once and you've encountered the same Pokemon in another area then you have to skip it and look for a new one. If you encounter a shiny Pokemon, you can choose to catch it. But if you do, you trade it for the previous encounter on the same route, and if you already have that Pokemon shinyless, both need to go. So you lose two Pokemon by getting a shiny. When you find a gym leader, you can only bring the same amount of Pokemon that the gym leader has. This evens out the battle even more along with the level caps. Speaking of level caps, I have my own little spin on it you're allowed to match the next gym leader's leveled Pokemon. For example, the first gym leader in Orberg City, Roark, has the following Pokemon. Level 12 Geodude, level 12 Onyx, and level 14 Kranidos. This means you can bring two level 12 Pokemon and one level 14 Pokemon. This rule also applies to Elite 4. However, this creates a bit of a gray area. Because between each fight, you want to level up different Pokemon in order to meet the next member's weakness. This can cause a few Pokemon to technically go over level but I allow it. I do allow the use of rare candies, but that's only to avoid some meaningless grinding. And I even have a rule for it. You can first use the rare candies once you're standing right in front of the present gym leader after having beat all the gym trainers. And you're only allowed to use rare candies to reach the level cap of the Pokemon you bring in the gym fight. But once the gym leader has been defeated, you are allowed to level up any Pokemon up to the defeated gym leader's highest level Pokemon. Other than bringing less Pokemon to the gym fights, my nothing rules 
doesn't really make the Pokemon games harder. It just makes it so it's more enjoyable. Moving on from the rules. We have an easy to use encounter guide listing all the routes in Sinnoh region before you get to the Elite Four. I made this to make it easier to keep track of when and where to catch certain Pokemon. Right from the first route, it's important that you think about your encounters so you can get good Pokemon later. For instance, the way to ensure a Gibble starts before the first gym. Let me explain. Gibble can be found in Wayward Cave after the second gym underneath the cycling bridge. In here you can find an Onyx, Geodude, Zubat, Bronzer and of course Gibble. As you can see, there are 5 different Pokemon that can show up in here, making Gibble be your first encounter pretty unlikely. Luckily, with my list, you can eliminate all other Pokemon, ensuring that you're getting a Gibble out of those 5. How I hear you asking? Well, if you look at the guide, the first encounter we can eliminate is Zubat. Zubat is best to encounter in the Ravage Path since it's only up against a Psyduck. In case of a Psyduck, you can always wait till nighttime and try to catch Zubat in many different places. After Zubat, we fight the rival and head to Orberg City. On the way, we pass through Orberg Gate and have a high chance to pick up a Geodude. If you're unlucky, you may get a Psyduck encounter again. But even then, there's still hope. North of Orberg City, you can go to Route 207 and roll again for a Geodude. Now time for Onyx. If you at this point don't have both Geodude and Zubat, it's important to repel when going to the first gym leader in the Orberg Mine. You want to save the encounter down here because it's the only place you can get an Onyx before beating Gym 6 and going to the Iron Islands. In my 10 attempts, only once did I not have both a Zubat and a Geodude at this point. But even then, I just repelled through the cave, used my document and found Zubat and Geodude other places and then came back for the Onyx later. Last but not least, Bronzor. Without a doubt, the most difficult to get early in the game. The reason for this is its low encounter rate almost everywhere. To increase our chances, we need to learn a new skill called Repel Encountering. In order to understand this technique, let's take a closer look at the early Bronzor encounter before the second gym. To the east of Wellstone City, we have Route 211. On this route, we have a 15% chance to encounter a Machop between level 14 and 15. We also have a 40% chance of a Metatite between level 13 and 15, 20% chance of level 14 Bidoof, 15% chance of Chingling between 14 and 16, and finally a 10% chance of a Bronzor level 14 to 16. As you can see, very low odds on the Bronzor. But if we put any level 16 Pokemon in the front of our party and activate a Repel, all other Pokemon below this level won't show up, meaning it's only between Bronzor and Chingling, making the encounter almost 50-50 much better odds. In case this fails, just beat the second gym, then go to Mount Cornet and use the same technique with a level 18 Pokemon instead. Most of the time, following this step by step will get you all 4 Pokemon, leaving you with only Gable right after the second gym. At this point, if I fail to get either a Bronzor or an Onyx, I like to go down to the Wayward Cave anyway to try my luck for the encounter. The encounter segment is filled with these tips and tricks and all the routes are listed chronologically. That way you can see what Pokemon are at your disposal at different points in the game. But there's more to the document than just the encounters. It even has an item guide. Now, the items featured in this list are primarily held items, with a few TMs thrown in here and there. I have not featured healing items, or the many hidden shards, stardusts, nuggets, you know, the nice to have items. It's only the most important items that actually have an impact in fights. Along the item's placement, I have added a small description that briefly explains the effect of the item. I did this because the in-game descriptions is sometimes very bad, so I chose to fletch them out, making it easier to understand. For the TMs, I can't tell you what Pokemon you should learn them on, but I can tell you what Pokemon will learn this move by leveling up anyways. TMs are only one-time use in this gen. You want to save them and not waste them on Pokemon that would get the move anyway. The items are also listed according to the gyms. So, if an item is listed after the gym, that means you now have the needed HM to get said item. That is also the reason why some routes, like Mount Cornet, are listed multiple times. Now, we have a bit of a controversial segment to cover here in the document. The cheating segment. If you're playing Platinum on an emulator, chances are you're using Dismume. If not, there might be another segment interesting to you, so hang on. Built into the Dismume emulator is a cheating tool that can be used for everything. But unlike the segment suggests, I have not mentioned any direct cheats, only the ones that I deem necessary to increase the enjoyment of the game. For instance, in Sinnoh you have a few guaranteed encounters that happen at specific times and on specific days. When I do a run, I like to use cheat codes to make them appear since I don't want to wait till nighttime or specific day. 
Of course, this is only to be used on the same route that the encounter would otherwise be guaranteed. The cheating is stuff like that. Pretty harmless, I would say. I won't go more into it here, so if you want, you can check it out if you wish. Finally, we have a segment that's going to be ever-changing, because I want you to help me create it. The community segment. If you have anything to add to the document, you can just add my Discord, the link will be down below. And while you're there, might as well subscribe. Isn't that what they all say, huh? But anyways, on Discord you can send me a message with your tips and tricks you would like to share, so that way our shared knowledge can become bigger. We actually already have a Twitch viewer who's added a segment about Pokéhex, which I have never used. But I read its description and it seems to be a good addition if you hate stuff like having to wait for friendship evolutions. So yeah. That's it. That covers the entire document. See ya. Raindrops are falling on my head. And just like the guy whose feet are too big for his bed, nothing seems to fit. Those raindrops are falling on my head. They keep falling.